The Daytona International Speedway was built of equal parts asphalt and spite. Kicked out of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1954, Big Bill France Sr. set to work building a 2.5-mile super speedway of his own for his fledgling stock car racing circuit. France's crews dug up so much Daytona Beach soil that the resulting hole became a man-made lake. In the end, 31-degree banked corners and an 18-degree trioval proved too fast for open-wheel veterans from Indy. But the track was perfect for the stars of France's National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing, or NASCAR. The first Daytona 500 in 1959 ended in a photo finish so close, the winner couldn't be determined for three days. The Daytona 500 is one of a kind in professional sports, both opening day and a season all its own. To finish is an accomplishment. Winning makes you a champion. In most NASCAR races, practice qualifying in the race cover just a couple days. For the 500, the gauntlet consumes an entire week, and these speed weeks start less than 90 days after the previous season ends. Even the series champion has little time to celebrate his title before he's back working again. Thrown into the mix are a pair of qualifying races to give drivers a chance to improve their starting position and to allow slower cars a second chance to bump someone else out of the field. Only after that comes the main event, 200 laps for 500 miles. Some teams have to change transmissions, engines, or the entire car just to take the green flag. High speeds and close quarters lead to spectacular accidents, while the sheer length of the race tests the limits of every piece of equipment. It is arguably the hardest race to win in all of NASCAR. As of this writing, the Daytona 500 has been run 62 times. Seven of those victories belong to Richard Petty, NASCAR's winningest driver. David Pearson, second only to Petty in career wins, took it just once and had to rip it from Petty's hands. On that February day in 1976, the two hooked bumpers while battling for the lead, sending both cars crashing into the outside wall. Only Pearson's quick decision to shove in the clutch kept his battered Mercury under power so it could limp across the finish line. Such are the stakes, and the lengths to which drivers will go to take stock car racing's biggest prize. In the history of the great American race, Pearson has been the rule, and Petty the exception. Dramatic late race moments and one-time winners are most common. Both happen to define the career of a driver who was anything but Dale Earnhardt. In 1986, Earnhardt ran out of fuel in the final laps and blew the engine, leaving Pitt Road. In 1991, he damaged his car striking a low-flying seagull, then wrecked during a tight battle for second. In 1997, he wrecked out of second again and indignantly climbed back in his destroyed Chevrolet just so he could finish. He'd finally win it the next year. It was the only time he ever did. In 2001, while rounding the final corner on the final lap, the race took his life. And then there was 1990. Second only to Earnhardt's fatal accident, the 1990 Daytona 500 holds a special place of infamy to fans of The Intimidator. Just one year earlier, three-time series champion Darrell Waltrip, another of the sport's winningest drivers, scored his only 500 in his 17th attempt. Not to be outdone by his biggest rival, Earnhardt led 155 of 200 laps in 1990, the most he'd ever lead in a race there. He led nearly all of the 156th, drawing away from traffic as he entered the third turn for the final time. In just 18 more seconds, he would have been first across the finish line. But suddenly the number three slid up the track and slowed, letting three cars rush by to his inside. And as radio and television announcers struggled to make sense of what had happened, someone had just as suddenly won his first ever Winston Cup race. His name was Derek Cope. The 31-year-old Cope was not the first to score his maiden victory in the Daytona 500, nor was he the last. In 1963, the ironically nicknamed Dwayne Tiny Lund, 6'5 and 270 pounds, went from rescuing an injured Marvin Panch to winning in his car the next Sunday. Mario Andretti won the 500 in 1967, two years before he ever drank the milk at Indy. Pete Hamilton gave the winged Plymouth Superbird its only 500 win in 1970. Sterling Marlin ended a 279 race winless streak by taking it in 1994, and in 2001, Michael Waltrip followed suit in his record 463rd. Then there was Trevor Bain, who in 2011 took it in just his second ever cup race, and just hours after celebrating his 20th birthday. But for whatever reason, Cope's win hasn't been held in as high regard as the race's other first-time winners. 
Whether secondary to the retelling of Earnhardt's now mythic legend, or simply overlooked, many accounts of that 500 are couched in the Intimidator's disappointment, and not the life-changing moment it was for Cope. He's commonly referred to as an unheralded driver, trivia to be recalled with momentary bemusement. But like J.D. McDuffie in his final race, there is more to Derek Cope than that moment, and more to that moment than is widely known. This, then, is that story, one that continues to this very day.